Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I hope that this session dealing with China and the other, or China and minorities, particularly Tibetan and Uyghur minorities currently in China, uh, will be of some interest to you. And I hope that I'm sure that the speakers will be very, will have very informative talks. Um, if you have a cell phone, please turn the cell phones off. Um, and also, please refrain from videotaping uh, the talk. Uh, it's being videotaped as I speak right now um, by the Fairbanks Center, but please do not videotape these, these talks that we have here. Um, so without further ado, I'll uh, have our first speaker come up to the podium, or rather not, there's no podium here, but he'll stay, stay there, he just told me. Um, and we'll sit uh, at the desk, behind the desk, uh, giving our talks. The talks will last about 20 minutes each, and after that we'll have some minutes for questions and answers. So that's the format we follow. We don't have a lot of time, so for this reason, time is kind of short, and there's lots of things to talk about by our speakers. So as I said, if we have some time left over, I will be happy to uh, have a Q&A session afterwards. Thank you very much. And our first speaker is Professor Shemirong from uh, Renmin University in Beijing. He is um, um, a Jiangjiang professor at uh, Renmin University, uh, specializing in Tibetan and Tibetan intellectual history and Sanan Tibetan Buddhism. And he'll give our first talk on Ch uh, Chinese studies uh, in um, uh, uh, Tibet, on Tibetan uh, on Tibetan culture and civilization. Professor Weirong, Shen Weirong. I'm very grateful to. Uh, Leonardo van der Kuyp, and uh, for inviting me to join this uh, panel discussion. Actually, about a month ago, I think you wrote me an uh, email and asked me to join this panel. So I, I said yes without any hesitation. I thought I'm a part of the, the, the Tibetan studies in China, so I'm <laughs> legitimated to talk about. But as the date is approaching, and I became more and more nervous. So uh, I became very skeptical whether I'm able to talk about the state of uh, uh, Tibetan studies in China because I, to be honest, I read more English books in this field than Chinese books. I did, did not really know much about the, the new development oh, uh, about the, the uh, how to say, the, the, the Tibetan studies in China or the, the Tibetan studies made by Chinese scholars uh, in China. Uh, so uh, uh, not very long ago, actually, I published one essay on the state of uh, uh, Tibetan studies in US. So I, but I, today I try to uh, talk a little about what I know about the Tibetan studies in China. So in 2009, I was invited to join uh, also a panel discussion about the, the uh, Tibetan studies or Tibetan Buddhist studies in China uh, for the last uh, 60 years because on the occasion of the anniversary of the establishment of the People's Republic of China in, uh, in Beijing Zhangxue Yenzhou, Yenzhou Zhongxin. So I made the following uh, observation, I, I said, uh, since the Tibetan studies in China for the last uh, 60 years is mostly focused on the Tibetan historical studies, or even uh, uh, focused on to justify or to legitimate why uh, Tibet is an integral part of China, so from the very beginning. So I said, uh, and uh, the direct result of this is an over, overwhelming uh, emphasis on Tibetan historical studies is uh, and the development of other uh, subdivisions of Tibetan studies. For example, the, uh, for uh, Tibetan Buddhist studies in China remains underdeveloped. So we uh, have not much to talk about. So uh, I only can maybe mention two or three scholars in this field, like Professor Wang Sen or Professor uh, Liu Chen. He did a, a quite good works on a Tibetan a Buddhist uh, a doctrine and a, a Tibetan Buddhist logic. Uh, besides that, so I couldn't uh, think of, of many so achievements in in. Uh, Tibetan Buddhist studies in China, even for the uh, last uh, 60 years. But there's an uh, overwhelming emphasis on Tibetan uh, 
historical status didn't bring us to, to anywhere. So I saw that the, uh, uh, as, as, as people always believe, so the all true history is a contemporary history. <laughs> so uh, uh, there a lack of, 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 of a dialogue uh, between the, like the, the Chinese uh, Tibetan historians and the Western uh, Tibetan historians. And uh, I have the impression the, the Western uh, Tibetan historians maybe want to save the history uh, from the, uh, save, uh, save the history from the uh, nation state. But the uh, uh, Chinese did the opposite way. We want to, to save the nation state from the history. So we studied the history, only wanted to uh, improve the Tibet was a part of China. And uh, I, I think the, uh, not to waste a lot of time and, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, resources. And uh, maybe we should uh, go further and do something else and is much uh, fruitful for, for us. That's, uh, that's what I made. So in the, the uh, uh, observation in 9, uh, 2009, but since then actually uh, uh, still, the, uh, the, the Chinese uh, Tibetan studies still uh, focus on the Tibetan historical studies. Until very recently, actually, the, the, the huge project also called the Xizang Tongshi, the Tibetan, uh, the general history of, of Tibet, uh, still not uh, fully uh, completed. And uh, the uh, 12 volume uh, uh, the, 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 uh, is going to be uh, published soon. Uh, the, we published the one like as a probe is uh, several months ago but they're still wo working on that so in in china as i said the, maybe we say the the great achievements uh, of tibetan studies as in in the in the field of tibetan historical studies but the the result is mostly ignored i think also i read a part of the the the, the general history of tibet uh, i would say is is a is a, also uh is not up to to date uh, standard. Maybe most of them still uh, in the in the uh, standard of 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 ninety eighties or the ninety nineties. So it's difficult. But uh, very recently, uh, in uh, maybe last ten years, so uh, if we see the, the new development of, of a, a Tibetan that is China, so we I can just uh, say from my own experience, I became a so so called the how to say that the, the evaluator of, of the, the uh, proposed project by the National Fund of Social Science, so Guojia Seke Jijing. So every year I evaluate like uh, uh, more than 100 those uh, proposed projects on Tibetan studies. And uh, to my biggest surprise, the most of those projects uh, is uh, uh, the project in the field of, of sociology, uh, mass media, and, 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 and uh, anthropology, or some like uh, this project about the uh, digitalizations. And all those, those projects is concerns about Tibetans stability and the, the, the development of the Tibetan agriculture or the, the nomads life, about the, the monastic uh, uh, e economy and the social uh, management and about the, the uh, Dalai Lama and the reincarnation systems of some projects and also actually many projects is a sort of response to the uh, uh, Tibetan uh, discourse uh, in the Western media. And uh, of course, those projects are very important. They are talk about the real Tibet. So what, what we are doing, we are almost talk about the virtual Tibet or imagined Tibet or Shangri-La. Uh, however, I think that all those projects is not in the sense of, of a conventional, uh, how to say, the, the uh, Tibetological studies. So what do we have, like uh, textual studies, uh, philological studies, or even uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhist studies. So uh, that's a new new development. So I, I'm... Um, Often I I, I, I sort of I couldn't really uh, agree to to give them a, a pro, my approval to get the money from the government. <laughs> all, all those those project uh, proposed projects look very similar. So, is a, 
And then I say there's no no trend is also um, over, overall. So in China, is there is a shift of, of the school from the so-called the academic uh, uh, like study institutions uh, like the Chinese Academy for Social Science, of like in, in our field is the, the Chinese Center Research Center for for Tibetology, or also even the 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 the, uh, the Institute for uh, uh, national minority uh, studies is a shift from the academic um, institution to s sort of like a state-run uh, think tank. So it's a new uh, uh, institution, as I call it, the Qizhang Zhiku, the think tank of Tibet, is newly established uh, in the Chinese academy. For, for social science. And the, the CTRC, the, the Ch Chinese uh, Research Center for Tibetan Studies, is also sort of early days we thought that it's uh, actually a research institution, an academic institution, but now is also very similar to uh, their function, similar to the uh, uh, think tank. That's, uh, then we, uh, if we talk to uh, Tibetan studies in, in conventional sense and tra traditional sense, so uh, maybe we, we have to uh, start uh, with uh, uh, the professor, the Mr. Yu Daoquan. So we, we, we consider him as, as the father of, of Chinese uh, Tibetology. And, uh, and he was a, a, a well-known uh, figure in, in, in China for Tibetan studies, but uh, actually he did very little. Uh, for Tibetan studies itself. He's a big follower of uh, Madame Blavatsky. I think he was a, a follower of, of, of Sal Sophie, and uh, he interested more in, in uh, a ghost <laughs> or the spirits than doing Tibetan studies. But of course, we, 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 we China, of, you, as you know, we often say that we had everything much earlier than you have. So we, Tibetan studies started from the, 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 uh, the how to the uh, compilation of a new uh, an, uh, an old uh, town and Xinjiu <laughs> Tangsu, uh, as I said. Uh, uh, our, 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 the Tibetan studies uh, started much later than uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Western world. So uh, we did a, a lot of Tibetan historical studies, but uh, is not uh, uh, how to say recognized uh, so worldwidely. And uh, if if we talk, about, I'm not going to talk the details. But if we talk about the the newly development, so in, in detail, I said uh, maybe three three things we have to to mention. And one is actually the, the, the publication wave. I think so we, uh, we published uh, a great amount of old Tibetan uh, texts. So I think if we, uh, we do not have TBRC now, but I think that those publications will be very much, uh, how to say, uh, valued. So uh, as in China, you see the, uh, everywhere uh, is, is, is uh, published new uh, Tibetan books. The, the first one uh, I should mention is uh, the new uh, compilation of, of, uh, of a Tibetan uh, Ganju and Danju. So uh, and, uh, is, a, is also a state-run project uh, led by the CTRC and for, for 20 years. And I did not use that uh, very much, but uh, should be uh, counted as a big achievement. Then I think it's everywhere. I think it is in in Beijing and in in, in the, those old Tibetan areas, Gansu, Qinghai, uh, Sichuan, uh, Yunnan, they all publish the old Tibetan books. The uh, Songbongs and the uh, the monastery uh, Gacha and the, and the all. Uh, I think some is is, is repeated. The, like the, the Sakya Sumbong, the published in Beijing, published in, in Tibet, and also in Gansu and, and Qinghai. But many books, is a, to, to my great surprise, we thought of with culture uh, revolution or the destroyed everything. But I think there's more and more books, so rare books, we didn't uh, now be uh, newly discovered and published. And the one other uh, publishing, uh, uh, publication project is run by uh, Tutenima, Rinpoche, and the Betsy. I think we have a lot of books. Not only the, the, those books we oh, I to mention, then the, the, it's the, the uh, publication of the Dunhuang Tibetan manuscripts. So it's a maxi, I have to say this, uh, facsimile uh, reprint on the Kalakutu uh, 
text uh, is, is, is also uh, 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 reprinted in China. We, as a Chinese scholar, had the first time had the full access to those uh, precious uh, texts. It was uh, certainly a, a big uh, uh, how to say, achievement, also, also especially for for Chinese scholars, we uh, did not have access for those texts for uh, one century. The, the second, I think, uh, is the time it's almost up. <laughs> okay, is all I, uh, I should mention is uh, uh, we a lot of the archaeologists uh, did great jobs. So in uh, uh, in. In Gaji, the West Tibet, or the, in Qinghai, uh, led by uh, a, a archaeological team uh, in Sichuan University, where uh, Professor Le uh, Leonard Van der Kuyp, uh, uh, very, very much uh, associated, and then by uh, also like uh, scholars like Tong Tao in Beijing, and the other Zhang Jianlin in, in uh, Xi'an, they did a lot, lot of good works. So in uh, West Tibet and the Kokono regions, and actually uh, gave us a better opportunity to understand the, the Tibetan civilization, the prehistorical uh, civilizations. And the second is, I think, uh, what we made the uh, uh, great achievement is is a Tibetan Buddhist art historical studies with Professor uh, uh, Krimborg is out is a, a specialist in, in other field so uh, many teams uh, is one is led by Professor Xie Jishen now in Zhejiang University the other uh, is a, is a Luo Wenhua in in in, in Gu Gong. Uh, he uh, did actually systematic, systematically so uh, investigation of all the Tibetan uh, monasteries uh, um, uh, one by one, and uh, they also doing a lot of like uh, digitalizing uh, jobs. Uh, a team is is doing uh, led by Lu Wenhua is uh, digitalizing all the the murals in in uh, uh, in in Da Zhao Si, and uh, then the the Zhejiang University teams are doing uh, digitalizing works in uh, many uh, monasteries in in, in Ari. I think they're doing similar works as the people, uh, the, the International Dunhuang Project that did uh, for for Dunhuang uh, cave uh, uh, paintings. I think that's the uh, I, I should mention that's for for the. Um, the new development in Tibetan studies in, in China. The other one I, I, I should mention maybe is, a, is a, uh, also the work done uh, by myself and uh, by uh, some of my students. So in uh, uh, explore like new uh, sources on um, Sino-Tibetan Buddhist studies. Uh, as you know, so the Tibetan studies is uh, almost always as related to uh, Indo-Tibetan Buddhist studies. Uh, uh, very strongly, I think we do. What we're doing Tibetan Buddhist studies is uh, Indo-Tibetan Buddhist studies uh, since uh, uh, several years now. I think maybe uh, around ten years. I'm promoting so-called Sino-Tibetan uh, Buddhist studies. And the first, we uh, discovered a, a lot of uh, texts uh, uh, started from the Tangut Sha time and until the, the, the early Qing time, the, uh, the, the Chinese translations of Tibetan tantric uh, manuscript uh, texts is um, a lot of the uh, involved in, in tantric Buddhism. So we use those texts uh, doing uh, our philological uh, works on those texts and to reconstruct the history of uh, how Tibetan tantric Buddhism, uh, Tibetan Buddhism was introduced uh, into uh, central Eurasia earlier and into uh, China proper. The other one, I think we're also doing the, uh, the both the Dunhuang uh, Tibetan and, and the Chinese uh, texts and to, uh, to research on the, the interaction between uh, uh, Sino, uh, uh, Chinese Buddhist tradition and the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. And one interesting thing is we, we actually uh, uh, figured out, I think, the, the, uh, even in the Dunhuang area, the, after the, the Tibetan uh, Empire, or after the Tibetan occupation of, of the Central Asia uh, uh, areas, Actually, the, the interaction between uh, Tibetan and, and the Chinese Buddhism was intensified. This is not a one-way street. Not only Tibetans uh, influence the Chinese Buddhism, but as a uh, in as a, a, a opposite, uh, oppositional way, I think the Chinese Buddhism 
uh, strongly influenced also Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, for example, for the for the uh, Avalokiteshvara code, they often thought uh, this uh, the, the Tibetan tradition. But we know uh, through our studies, we became uh, more and more uh, clear actually the Tibetans uh, mostly accepted the Chinese tradition in, in, in the in the Avalokiteshvara code. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. We now could go to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Brenton Sullivan, and he'll be, he's from Colgate University, and he'll be speaking on, the title of his talk is The Humming of Tibetan Buddhist Monasteries, How Collective Ritual Gave Rise to the Dalai Lamas and His Order of Tibetan Buddhism. This is the humming. <laughs> I'm going to place my laptop up here so that maybe my colleagues who have the screen at their backs can make out something of what I'm talking about. Maybe not. It's quite small there. I'd like to begin by thanking Professor Vanderkype and the Fairbank Center for inviting me here. I'm very happy to be here today on such a beautiful day. And I'd like to begin, if I may, with a very brief vignette. Uncle Losong woke up suddenly. The last notes of the conch shell bugles were still lingering in the cold, damp air. That must have been the first round of bugle calls, he thought. He wrapped his sen shawl around his body and hurried outside to rinse out his mouth and squat over the latrine. His master was already awake, chanting hymns from the adjacent room. Losong estimated he had maybe 10 minutes to grab the rest of his things and head out the door to join the rest of the congregation in stumbling up the hill to the main assembly hall. Just then the second blast of bugle calls began. And so with his heavy dagam cloak draped around his shoulders and his yellow hat in hand, he turned toward the door. He was only 17 and so in his drowsy state, he almost forgot his chapril, a decorative canteen hanging on the wall of his room. This was a requisite part of his uniform for attendance at assembly. Today was the first day of the summer retreat, a 45 day period marked by fierce debates and defenses of the most advanced scholars, ritual dancing, and heightened ritual activity. The whole period was preceded by the major religious festival, marking Shakyamuni Buddha's turning of the wheel of the Dharma, his first sermon on the eighth day of the sixth month. Here's a map indicating Akalosong's monastery in north, on the northeastern edge of the Tibetan Plateau, an image from 1937 of that monastery, a Qing painting of that monastery. Now at the same time, over 700 kilometers north and east of Losong's monastery, another young monk, Master Jamyang, was participating in his own monastery celebration of the turning of the wheel of the Dharma and the subsequent summer retreat. Although here the turning of the wheel of the Dharma and the, it culminated on the sixth day of the sixth month rather than the eighth day, the ritual program and the busy atmosphere it evoked were more or less the same. Now, Losong and Jamyang likely never met each other, not least because they are fictional composite characters that I made up for this talk, but also, and more importantly, because their monasteries were not linked in any explicit way as are, say, child or branch monasteries to so-called mother monasteries. So how did this come to be? How did it come to be that these two individuals learned many of the same hymns, prayers, and rituals, and performed these for many of the same deities and carried them out at roughly the same time? How did this come to pass? And I answer this question by saying that they're both members 
of the Geluk school of Tibetan Buddhism is to beg the question, how did the Geluk school of Tibetan Buddhism come to be the most widespread and recognized school of Buddhism in Tibet? How is it that it came to be seen as the conservative, quote, school of virtue? A complete answer to this question is obviously beyond um, the time I have today and beyond my own means. But I do want to suggest that one crucial factor that has been overlooked is collective ritual and ritual texts. So I first want to say a couple words about the importance of ritual for understanding Tibetan religion, Tibetan society, and I think religion and society in other places in the world as well. Ritual is one of the most crucial yet most overlooked aspects of monastic life and monastic administration. I often speak of it metaphorically as the engine that fires monasteries or the blueprint of its inner architecture. Stephen Beyer, the author of one of the best studies of ritual in Tibetan Buddhism, refers to the performance of rituals as, quote, the ultimate function of monks' monastic life. Yel Bentur, another prominent scholar of Tibetan ritual, agrees. She writes, in the majority of Tibetan monasteries, the performance of rituals is the principal undertaking of most monks. Now, despite this recognition of the importance of ritual for Tibetan religion and for Tibetan society as a whole, very little beyond the work of these two scholars has been done. Why is this the case? Why is it that the new subfield of ritual studies that we have in, within religious studies, for instance, not penetrated into the study of Tibet? One reason for this is that it's very hard to understand. It requires a lifetime, literally a lifetime, of memorizing, learning, memorizing hundreds of pages, sometimes thousands of pages of prayers, hymns, uh, ritual actions, and so forth. And not having gone through that, we can only come up with facile conclusions, such, that, such as that Tibetan ritual is mindless mimicry, or as one early scholar called it, contemptible mummery. <laughs> or as is more generally thought, that most monks are lazy, or worse, uh, debauched. So, I want to try to correct the perception that most monks were engaged in, quote, memorizing only a few prayers, as one scholar calls, says, or that they, quote, only had an hour of service each day and otherwise had to kill time, as a very early observer of Tibetan Buddhism says. And I want to try to contribute to a more theoretical understanding of the importance and function of ritual for Tibetan monasticism. So to do that, I first want to give you an idea of the terrific amount of time and energy that's spent as a member of a Tibetan Buddhist monastery. First of all, just to be a member of a monastery, to, to get gain admittance, requires at least a year, up to several years, of memorization and training, after which one is tested in front of the monastery's abbot. Then, and only then, one gains access to the assembly and the meals that are disseminated there at assembly. Now, by looking at two monastic constitutions, or sometimes I refer to them as customaries, drawing from the Christian tradition or monastic guidelines, by looking at two of these constitutions written for uh, Uncle Losong's monastery, Gunlung Monastery, we see that basically every single day is accounted for. Even if we exclude the rituals that are written particularly for discrete units within the monastery and instead just focus on the rituals that are written for the, the largest contingent of the monastery, we see that when you total them all up, you get to approximately 235 days per year dedicated to ritual activity, which of course is about eight months. It's of course about the same amount of time that students spend in uh, university courses here in the West. So it represents a considerable cost for membership in the monastery. In addition to getting it from these constitutions, in addition to getting an idea of the calendar, the liturgical calendar, we also get an idea of the specific hymns, prayers, and rituals that are to be performed there. So we're told, for instance, that assemblies to take place at least three times a day, usually morning, noon, and evening. But we're also told what text. So, for instance, the ritual recitation of the ornament of realization and the entrance to Madhyamaka. These are important texts for Geluk scholasticism. The non-conceptual loving one, 
a hymn composed by the founder of the Gelug school, Dzongkaba, elegantly written, composed by the first Dalai Lama, a tantric visualization of oneself as Vajrabhairava, who, who is one of the three most important Gelug patron deities, and so on. Now, significantly, the author of the first constitution for Gunung Monastery was a central Tibetan, uh, residing in a monastery in Un Valley near Lhasa, some thousand miles away from Gunung Monastery. And he wrote this in 1737 at the request of the officers and the monks at Gunlung Monastery, Uncle Losong's monastery. Now this phenomena of a centrally located monk writing a, oh, I should add here too, that this same figure who wrote the constitution for Gunung Monastery also wrote for other monasteries, including two very important monasteries located in central Tibet, Nartong and Rheting monasteries. And you find these collected together and found together in his collected works. Now this phenomena of a centrally located Geluk hierarch writing constitutions, including their liturgies for monasteries that are more perif peripherally located, is not unique to Gunung Monastery or the author of its constitution. In fact, if we do a survey of, of approximately 100 and, let's see, 147 extant constitutions, we find that the Geluk constitutions represent nearly three quarters of those. And if we restrict ourselves to just prior to the 20th century, in order to exclude very prolific Gelugpa hierarchs in the 20th century, such as the 13th Dalai Lama. And we just look pre-20th century. Even there, we find that Geluk constitutions make up about 70% 70 70 of the sample set of 99 extant constitutions. If we look across time, we see another unequal distribution, which is in the 18th century, a majority of these were constitutions were composed, and the remain, remainder of those, the mass majority of the remainders of those, were composed in the adjacent centuries, 17th and 19th centuries. So what happened in the 18th century? Well, obviously, a lot of things happened in that 100 plus years, uh, if, we, if we think of the long 18th century, not least of which was Qing, the Qing intrusion into Tibetan political and religious affairs. But this is also the period when the Geluk school became the Geluk school by fashioning its scholastic curricula, its administrative protocols, and its ritual liturgies. And thus, this is the time when the Gyalse of Un, the figure I, I alluded to a moment ago in central Tibet, wrote his constitution for Gunlung Monastery. It's also the period when Master Jiamyang's monastery in Inner Mongolia, known as Barunkai, was founded. And shortly after its founder, it, it shortly after it was founded, it too had a constitution written for it. In this case, it was written by a very famous Tibetan hierarch known as Zhang Jarope Dorje, who is initially from Gunlung Monastery, but spent most of his life in Beijing at the Qing court. And in this customary too, I'm oh, sorry, this constitution written for. Master Jamyang's monastery, there too we see the same overriding concern with the particular hymns that are be, to be chanted, prayers that are to be recited, rituals that are to be performed, and an overriding concern with orthopraxy, that is, learning the right rituals from a qualified master. And so, for instance, you find mention of one hymn, the 100,000 Gandham Gods, this is an important guru yoga of Dzongkaba, again, the founder of the Geluk school. The non-conceptual loving one, which I mentioned a moment ago, composed by that founder. Tantric visualization of oneself as Vajabhairava, one of, again, the three most important Geluk patron deities. So what do we make of this? What do we make of this level of ritualization? What happens when certain powerful hierarchs impose extensive liturgies for monasteries across the Tibetan plateau and in Mongolia, where hundreds and thousands of monks there collectively participate in chanting the same hymns and worshiping the same gods, all specifically linked to a particular sectarian identity, the Geluk identity. To answer this, I 
turn now to some evidence from cognitive science and cognitive anthropology, which I think can uh, offer some interesting insight into the function of ritual. So one study from 2000 by Richard Sosis on early American communes, religious and secular communes, finds that religious communes in early American history had an average survival rate of 25 0.3 years compared to 6.4 years for their secular counterparts, and that the odds of a secular commune dissolving within any given year were up to four times greater than those for religious communes. In a follow-up study that he did with Bresler in 2003, they tested a hypothesis trying to explain this discord, this, this difference, and they looked at a theory known as cost, costly signaling theory. This is borrowed from evolutionary biology. And really briefly, costly signaling theory is the idea that certain handicaps, like a peacock's uh, elaborate tail feathers or starting for antelope jumping up and down in fields, which are costly and don't lend directly any uh, benefit to survival, to reproductive success, might reliably signal to conspecifics, other members of their species, that they have some other desirable trait, like strength and speed. And so the idea here then is that um, membership costs, upfront costs of time spent in participating in ritual or other types of religious costs, um, might reliably signal to other members of that group, that religious group, that you're on board, that you're committed, and thereby contribute to group uh, solidarity. And well, then that this is precisely what they found in the study, that higher costs, such as celibacy and dietary restrictions, did correlate with greater longevity in religious groups. And yet another study, this time with Ruffle in 2003, looking at a different sample set, looking at Israeli kibbutzim, communities, both religious and secular communities, communes in Israel in the early 20th century, they found very similar and startling results that members of religious kibbutzim exhibit higher levels of cooperation than secular ones. Now, they measure this by having them participate in economic games. How many resources are you willing to share with other members of your community? How many of the, your, the resources you have here in this game are you willing to share with strangers and so forth? They found that religious males will exhibit higher levels of cooperation than religious females because of their greater participation in collective ritual, particularly daily prayer. And they found that the frequency of participation in collective ritual is positively correlated with cooperativeness. One of my favorite studies is was carried out among college students, where they grouped college students together and asked them to, uh, de based, depending on the group, one group would sing synchronously together sing together in time. Another group would both sing and move together in time, and I think they had them walking around campus swinging cups. Uh, a, th a third group, uh, they had them not singing or moving at all. And a fourth group, uh, they had individuals wearing headphones, so they were all singing and they are all moving, but they were doing it asynchronously, right? not together in time. And what these charts here show, the top two lines are the groups that were either singing together in time or singing and moving together in time. The bottom two lines are those other two groups. And the vertical y-axis here indicates how much they were willing to share in these various economics that they played. And thus, the conclusion is that moving together in time, uh, singing together in time, results in greater cooperation. Not only that, but it also changes perceptions of group members. So on exit interviews, uh, participants in this study were more likely to uh, attribute their willingness to cooperate to being, uh, having a sense of being on the same team. And one final study, Shujet and others at uh, Denmark's Aarhus University have done some really interesting work. And in this study here, they draw, well, they draw on a number of different laboratory studies that their team has done in order to try to explain the cognitive and neurological effects of ritual. And one of the characteristics of ritual, one of the most commonly pointed to characteristics of ritual is what's called gold emotion, in this case, gold emotion and causal opaqueness. Gold emotion here being the idea that the ultimate purpose of much ritual is hidden to participants. You Often that's less important than just performing the ritual precisely as it's to be done. Causal opaqueness being the idea that you don't necessarily know what part of the ritual results in the, in the, in the fruit of that act, but but nonetheless, it happens. 
And what they find is that individuals engaged in ritual-like behavior, where the goal of that, that act is not, is not clear, there's a certain opaqueness to, to why they're doing what they're doing, um, that those individuals end up diverting away cognitive uh, resources from interpretation and instead toward what they call here lower action parsing. In other words, the details, the minutia of performing the ritual the right way. And thus leaves ritual participants open to, susceptible to authoritative exegesis. So we shouldn't be surprised then that the Gelukpa, the Geluk school, at the same time that it was disseminating and systematizing and disseminating liturgical programs, specifying what these monks, how they're to fill their days, are also disseminating exegetical and doctrinal literature pertaining to ritual, interpreting for those monks what the, the point of that ritual is. So what does all this mean for the Gaelic school's success? In a word, indoctrination. A top-down systematic approach to designing a Gaelic liturgy and orthopraxy that complemented Gaelic orthodoxy helped pave the way for the school's success. Now, to be sure, um, the charisma of the fifth Dalai Lama that's attracted a lot of scholarly attention deserves the attention it has attracted. Likewise, the, states, the statecraft of his prime minister, Sangye Gyatso, deserves the scholarly attention that it has attracted. And of course, we can't forget the military support that the Kokonor Mongols gave to the Gelug school or the financial support that the uh, new young Qing dynasty began to lend to the Gelug school. But we can't stop there. We have to look also at what the Gelug themselves did with these resources. And what they did was, was very effective. They crafted and institutionalized the practices for the most important institutions in Tibetan society, the monasteries. And so if indoctrination leaves a bad taste in your mouth, we might just talk about socialization. Being a member of a group requires that members be socialized into its norms and practices. And often this is done without a member's conscious consent. We can't ignore our embodied nature. That is, we can't overlook how we sing and vocalize together. Thank you. Thank you very much for this talk as well. Our next speaker is Dr. Kobayashi from Toyobunko and currently Harvard Nanjing Research Scholar. He'll speak on independence or autonomy, translated concept in Tibet at the beginning of the 20th century. Dr. Kobayashi. We need a pinball wizard. Thank you very much, Professor Van der Kaip. And allow me to express my thanks to everybody here. The title of my presentation is Independence or Autonomy, Translated Concepts in Tibet as the Beginning of the 20th Century. After the demise of the Qin Dynasty, Britain, China, and Tibet discussed the political status of Tibet. Many researchers have studied studied those negotiations by analyzing the English materials. But in today's talk, through the comparative analysis between Tibetan and English documents, 
I'd like to point out that there are some problems when people talk about this historical issue by rely on merely on English political terms such as sovereignty, suzerainty, independence, and autonomy. And offer new insights into how Tibet articulated its own political status and its relationship with China. When people talk about Tibet, modern, modern Tibetan history, there is a conventional stereotype. Tibet crossed itself off, off the, off from the world and was isolated from the international community in the 19th and 20th century. But many researchers have emphasized recently, and as I will also discuss today, Tibet, headed by the 13th Dalai Lama, was deeply involved in international affairs and was not ignorant of the rest of the world. In today's talk, first, I'd like to talk about how the, how the Dalai Lama tried to establish Tibet's own political status in the family of the nations and build relationships with foreign countries around the collapse of the Qin dynasty. However, compared to the modern history of other East Asian countries, Many things about Tibetan diplomacy have not yet been clarified. Recently, many scholars have, have been researching how countries in East Asia translated, understood, and internalized Western, con Western concepts and ideas of modern international relations. But few people study, but few people have examined how, how it happened in Tibet. So one of, the, one of the remarkable topics of this field is the translation and circulation of international law. William Martin, uh, who was an American missionary in Beijing, translated American jurist Henry Wheaton's Elements of International Law into Chinese in 1864, called it Wang Guo Gongfa. This Chinese translated version was circulated in China, Japan, Korea, and a Mongolian version was created around 1911. Then those, con those countries gradually started understanding Western political concepts like sovereignty, which had not been in East Asia until the 19th century. The question is whether this book was circulated in Tibet, translated into Tibetan. So far, researchers have not discovered a Tibetan version of this book due to the difficulty of accessing Tibetan primary sources possessed by the Tibet Autonomous Region. However, by examining the, <clears throat> by examining the materials I've, I have collected in London and uh, India, I'd like to clarify how Tibet understood English political concepts, the conceptual gaps between Tibet, Tibetan and English terminology, and how these gaps affected Tibetan diplomacy. First, I will, I will br briefly talk about how China and Britain thought about the political status of Tibet. The British policy toward Tibet was that the Qing had limited authority over Tibet, which the British, British called suzerainty, something that the Viceroy of India, George Curzon, called, explained as a constitutional fiction. This labeling was, however, unacceptable for Qing officials. Qing officials started realizing that they had to assert their authority over Tibet as Zhu Chuan, distinguished from Shanban Chuan, which the British government had insisted, insisted upon. The Qing officials began to implement new policies to try to establish their unequivocal sovereignty over Tibet, and they eventually dispatched the Chinese army from Sichuan to Lhasa in 1910. This forced the 13th Dalai Lama to take refuge uh, in India until the summer of 1912. <clears throat> then uh, the, the 1911 revolution, Qin Hai Geming, and the collapse of the Qin, di Qin dynasty provided the Dalai Lama with an opportunity to, to, opportunity to expel the Chinese army from Tibet and restore his authority. Today, in the Tibetan language, independence exclusively translates to Ranzen, Ram means self, and Zen means power, force, strength. Zen is a very strong word. During the 8th and 9th century, Zen, 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 Zen refers to king of Tibet. So even though 
uh, the origin of this terminology is still unclear. We are able to find the same word in the, in the Dalai Lama's letter to the foreign dignitaries around this period. The Dalai Lama made huge effort in establishing relationship with many countries. I will show you a few images of his letters to the foreign dignitaries. Uh, this is a letter to the Lockheed, the US diplomat, in 1910. The letter to Russian Tsar Nicholas II in 1912. The letter to the Emperor Taisho in 1913, Japanese Emperor Taisho in 1913. And the, and the letter to King George V uh, in Britain in 19, 1913. So in all of the letters, the Dalai Lama asserted the independence of Tibet by using the word Ranzen. Here, I'd like to, to, I'd like to analyze this letter to the British government, which was a particularly important country for the Dalai Lama in terms of gaining support. I read a portion of the quotation. First, the Dalai Lama emphasized that Tibet and China have been in a priest patron relationship it signifies that the Dalai Lama had been, had, had been the highest authority in Tibet, and the Dalai Lama, and, and then uh, the Qin Emperor was to, was to protect Buddhism. It implies that the Dalai Lama criticized the Qin for unilaterally attempting to change this priest patron relationship, one of equal status, into a hierarchical relationship between ruler and subject. And if you look at A, we find that the Dalai Lama considers the establishment of relationships with uh, Russia and Britain in the manner of the diplomatic custom of Western countries, which dispatch diplomatic, uh, diplomatic representatives of recognized nations to each other as the most important aspect for the security of Tibet and in gaining its ransom. In part of me, the Dalai Lama clearly mentioned what is the next best option in the, in the case that dispatching representatives from Russia and Britain to Russia could not be accomplished. The Dalai Lama would be asking Britain, asking Britain to negotiate with various foreign countries in order to prevent China's interference with Tibet and to support the, support the independence, independent power of Tibet in regard to their main affairs. How did the British government interpret this letter in English? The letter was translated by a translator from the government of India. If we, and, but, but if we look at this, their translation, we find some parts that, that are worthy of scrutiny. In each case, not only was Lanzhen not translated into to independence, but also overall, these passages are slightly more exploratory than strict literal translation. We do find that officials of British India did not necessarily use independence as a fixed parallel translation of Lanzhen. In other words, Tibet and the British, the British did not have a common understanding of key political terms used to discuss the status of Tibet. In the next section, I examine how Tibet articulated an opinion about its political status in the, in the 1913-14 similar conference, which was held between Tibet, China, and Britain in India. It was a critically important event in modern Tibetan history. During this conference, the three parties discussed the relationship between Tibet and China after the demise of the Qin dynasty. Tibet asserted the independence in the first phase of that conference. Afterwards, however, Tibet signed a treaty that guaranteed not the independence, but the autonomy of Tibet and the Chinese suzerainty by accepting British reconciliation. Why did Tibet sign the treaty thus giving up its independence? Did Tibet make this concession to conclude the agreement under pressure from Britain? Since the conference was con conducted primarily in English, many researchers have analyzed the negotiations by examining English records. However, 
What has not been fully clarified is how Tibet articulated its own political status in the Tibetan language. One key document is the Tibetan records of, of, the, of this conference, the clear mirror of the negotiation of convention between Britain, China, uh, and Tibet in India in the Wood Tiger year. I will call it Kunsel Melon. One of the authors was Shatra Pendrodorje, the Tibetan plenipotentiary at the conference. By using this, te this, text, this text, I will examine how Tibet perceived and understood the modern concepts which were employed in the conference. According to the Kunse Melon, Tibet created the following statement submitted at the first meeting of the conference. Tibet clearly said Tibet is an independent country, and it is consistent with the assertions which Tibet had made before the conference. So this statement, this statement was translated by the British government. In this passage, Gerukapu Lansen was clearly translated into an independent state. However, China gave its counter proposal as shown here. China claimed, claimed sovereignty over Tibet and denied the independence of Tibet by referring to its historical relationship with Tibet during the Qin period. How did Tibet translate it? In the Tibetan language, nowadays, sovereignty is often translated into Dakwan. But how does the Kunse Melon uh, translate sovereignty into Tibetan? Here, under the sovereignty was translated into Ngao, under the rule, under the power. However, in the Kunse Melon, Ngao was not a fixed parallel translation of sovereignty but was also used as a translation of the other phrase theology, which referred to the relationship between rulers and subject. Moreover, we cannot see that uh, the, the word Dakwan in the Kunse Melon. Therefore, the trans translations of English terminology in the Kunse Melon, the, in the Kunse Melon indicate the possibility that the Tibetan language at that time did not have technical terminology that corresponded to the English political concepts of sovereignty. On the other hand, how was sovereignty translated in, in Kunse Melon? If you look at the reconciliation proposal by the British, British plenipotentiary Henry McMahon, you find that McMahon specified Chinese sovereignty over Tibet while they recognized, recognized uh, Tibetan autonomy. And in order to mediate the conflict about the demarcation of the border between Tibet and China, McMahon divided in Tibet into two, outer Tibet and inner Tibet. Tibet asserted its opposition to this British reconciliation. However, it opposed not the mention of the political status of Tibet, but the demarcation of the border with China. So did Tibet recognize Chinese sovereignty without strong opposition? In order to analyze its opposition or uh, its, its understanding of the reconciliation, I will examine the Tibetan translation of it. Here, sovereignty was not translated using uh, specific terminology, uh, but more using explanatory words, such as a part of the controlled area of the Chinese government externally. Moreover, what is noteworthy is that Lan Sen was used to translate autonomy. In the first phase of the conference, Gerukapu Lan Sen was translated into independent state in English. But autonomy in this reconciliation was also translated into Lanzen. Because of this lack of consistency, we need to discuss the usage of Lanzen in the, in the context of the Tibetan language, separately from, from the English concepts. As I mentioned in the first section of this presentation, the Dalai Lama, uh, in his letter to Britain, asked them to support the independent power of Tibet, which would prevent Chinese interference with Tibet as a minimum requirement. <laughs> 
Therefore, Lanzen was a concept to be deeply associated with an agenda regarding how to remove Chinese influence, influence uh, over Tibet. Based on this understanding, if we look at the Tibetan translation of the British, uh, the British reconciliation again, we find that first, uh, Tibet, Tibet would be treated as a controlled area of the, of the Chinese government externally. And this was connected to the second sentence by however, which was not mentioned in the original English version. So it emphasizes that, uh, emphasize that independent, independent, independence of the country in regard to main affairs. Thus, Shatra translated autonomy into Lanzhen and tried to devalue the Chinese authority. Uh, in, order to, in, other words, in other words, Tibet attempted to bring the treaty close to their own assertion by translating autonomy into Lanzhen. And this, this was because of the lack of the uniformity between the English and Tibetan terminologies. Term, terminologies. And this Tibetan, Tibetan translation was also reflected in the final agreement of the conference. The following quotation from Kunse Melon refers to the time period in which Shatra signed the treaty after the negotiations regarding the boundary problem. The power, uh, quote, the power of the land and community which is represented by independent of Tibet in, is excellent in all, all respects and ha, had never been included in the negotiations prior. In no way can it be better than it is even if we con conduct, continue to negotiate. Therefore, I will sign it immediately. Shatra thought that the Lanzhen of Tibet would be secured after concluding the, concluding the negotiation about delineating the boundaries of Tibet and made his decision to sign the, sign the draft of the treaty. Thus, if we look at the Kun we find that we find that Shatra did not easily make concession on the condition of Chinese suzerainty and Tibetan autonomy. His purpose is in accomplishing Lanzhen was a coherent assertion, uh, and it never changed even after Britain specified the political status of Tibet not as independence, independent but autonomous. He translated autonomy into Lanzhen in order to devalue Chinese authority and to focus more on the border issue to f in fulfilling the actual condition of Lanzhen, and then, and then he agreed to sign the draft of that treaty. So this is a similar, a similar authority, uh, image of the similar authority in Tibetan, Chinese, and uh, English. In conclusion, from the above analysis, I hope to have illuminated the limitation of the previous research that solely rely on English concepts and materials. First, I'd like to emphasize that the 13th Dalai Lama made significant diplomatic effort to promote Lanzhen around the collapse of the Qin dynasty. On the other hand, Tibet has only just initiated the project of interpreting and analyzing modern English concepts and perhaps Chinese ones. Therefore, although the similar conference is tri tripartite, tripartite uh, Tibet did not participate in this argument whether Chinese authority over Tibet was suzerainty or sovereignty. Regardless whether Chinese authority over Tibet was sovereignty or suzerainty, Tibet attempted to deny Chinese power itself as best as it could. So Tibet, at the end of the conference, continued to use Lanzhen uh, to devalue Chinese authority. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. And our last but not least speaker, Dr. Ryan Thumb. We're moving slowly northward now into Xinjiang. And Dr. Thumb, who is a, our own graduate from the Inner Asian program, will speak on how the Uyghurs became a minority. Okay, so um, in the um, 
retrospective spirit of this um, celebration, uh, to which I'm very grateful to have been invited. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about how um, we talk about the Uyghurs, or we have written about the Uyghurs. And this is a, uh, the, the topic I'm going to talk about today, which is particularly the minority part of minority ethnicity, the Shao uh, uh, Shu and Shao Shu Minzu. Um, in this rare case, the we embraces um, both Chinese scholars of, of Xinjiang or of Uyghur culture, uh, Western scholars of, of uh, Xinjiang and Uyghur culture, and also the, um, the state discourse around, uh, around the Uyghurs. Uh, because all of us, except I would say for the most part Uyghurs themselves, um, uh, use this word minority quite uncritically, um, which, is, which is odd because a lot of attention has been given to the, to the word minzu itself. I mean, hundreds of papers, I would say, um, dozens, of, dozens of books um, telling the story of how, how the term came from, uh, from Japan around the 20th, 20th century. But, but we, we're taking, we seem to be taking this uh, term shaoshu, and I've, I've been doing it for a long time too, the shaoshu part of this uh, term for granted. I, I've traced about five pages of scholarly writing between, say, three authors on the origins of, of shaoshu, and, and none of it deals with its subsequent uh, ramifications. The fact that Shao Shu has received so little scrutiny is, I think, a testament to uh, its power. So today I want to think more about the way the minority term works as well as its effects. And I want to do so through um, the example of the minority group whose, whose history I know best, which is the, the Uyghurs. Essentially, the Uyghurs have gone uh, from foreign barbarians in the pre-Qing Chinese system to a kind of pseudo-equal subjects in, an, in a multi-ethnic Qing empire to minorities in the Chinese nation state. Now, from the Uyghur perspective today, the term minority looks quite strange. Um, uh, the Uyghurs are, of course, um, mostly, most of the Uyghurs live in this region of, of Altishahar, the southern, uh, the southern chunk of of Xinjiang, and um, for those who aren't familiar with them, these are Turkic-speaking uh, settled settled Muslims, um, and they lend their name to this larger uh, administrative unit of Xinjiang, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous uh, Autonomous Region, uh, which is a part of China today because of uh, the Qing conquest of 17, um, 1759. In any case, um, in my work on Uyghur history, I've always been surprised. Uh, to hear people talk about the Uyghurs as minorities, because I've done a lot of uh, field work in this southern part. And in this southern part, um, most Uyghurs are not living the experience of a numerical minority. You can, you can see here on this um, uh, demographic map, each, each yellow dot represents um, 5,000 uh, Han inhabitants, and each purple dot uh, represents 5,000 5,000 Uyghurs. When you're, when you're down there in the south and when you're in rural areas, which is where most, uh, most Uyghurs live, live today, um, Han, Han people are quite a rarity. So I think a lot of um, particularly um, not so highly educated Uyghurs would be surprised to find themselves called, um, called a, numerical, uh, a numerical minority. Um, of course, there's also the practical question of how, how there's a practical element of how they became minorities, which is in its most basic sense through the Qing conquest of uh, 1759, um, at which time, before which time, the uh, Uyghurs were not minorities by any standard. Um, in the current usage of minority to describe Uyghurs, then minority is dependent entirely on borders. They are minorities, a more numerical minority in the sense that they have fewer numbers in the in the context of the larger larger Chinese uh, nation state, which makes minority a term entirely in embedded in questions of territoriality and uh, sovereignty, which is generally not a strong foundation for dispassionate scholarship. Um, 
Minority is a very rare word in Uyghur. It's hardly ever used in literature or in day-to-day -day conversation. It seems to be translated directly from the Chinese uh, with Shaoshu, small in number, uh, becoming Az Sanlik, same, same exact meaning um, in Uyghur. And it appears in official contexts, such as the names of certain um, government bureaus. But like I said, generally, outside of this context, Uyghurs um, are not using this term. So why then are the Uyghurs so often labeled minor minorities, even outside of China? Well, most obviously, it's because they're officially labeled as such by the government uh, for reasons that I'll explore in a, in a few minutes. But I think it's also important to think about why outsider scholars have, have used this term uh, so frequently. Partly it's due to the government, but I think a lot of it is also because um, we've been willing to do it because so much of the scholarship on the Uyghurs is based on um, field experience in the city of Urumqi, uh, which you can see from this map it is in fact a place of majority um, uh, Han inhabitation. Uh, this is simply because it's the easiest place for a, a foreigner to get permission to live uh, and study, and it's it's really heavily shaped, I would say even distorted, our view of what life is like for Uyghurs as a whole, what the political situation of Xinjiang um, as, as, a whole, uh, as a whole is. Um, I've got a little statistic down here that you might not be able to see. 9% of Uyghurs live in large cities where they are numerical minorities. And I would venture that the story is somewhat similar for Tibetans. A lot of what I'm um, going to be saying today is, is probably equally applicable to the Tibetan situation. So this got me thinking about the, um, my experience with, with being in, in, in Uyghur areas and, and feeling uncomfortable with the minority term got me thinking about the work that this word minority, particularly the Shaoshu part, is doing um, in China more broadly. Of course, minority is also a scholarly term, is frequently used by uh, sociologists writing in English, and, and there it doesn't necessarily mean a group in numerical minority, but rather a group with less power uh, than others. But that numerical sense of minority remains popular uh, in, in lay English usage as it does in the uh, Chinese usage. Indeed, the etymological origin of the term is even more readily apparent in, in uh, Chinese than it is uh, in English, as it is also in, um, in Russian. Um, this numerical sense, of course, gives the term minority an air of scientific impartial impartiality. Why are you a minority? Well, we counted everybody up, and your numbers are smaller than, than everyone else. Um, and uh, this veil of impartiality and consistency then serves to flatten out what is a great variety of ethnic and national interrelationships. Um, whether you accept the term colony or not, uh, Tibet and Alta Shahar are large, uh, ethnically homogeneous regions, roughly, ruled from outside without the consent of their inhabitants and subject to demographic and ethnic engineering uh, via a strong settler policy. And I should say that there's a consensus emerging in English language scholarship of, uh, of a willingness to call Xinjiang at least a, a colonial project or a colonial situation, if not directly a colony. There are three new books out this year, um, monographs on, on Xinjiang, all of which use this, uh, this terminology. But whether, <coughs> whether you call it or not, they share something, which is very different from the diasporic communities like, for example, the Hui, the, the Chinese-speaking, usually, Muslims, um, or groups in regions with high ethnic diversity like Yunnan. So all of these different, different types of, of, of ethnic landscapes are being flattened out into one, uh, one descriptor, uh, the effects of which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. For all the lumping together that this minority um, term achieves, it also has a splitting function, and that is it, it divides China's official ethnicities into two, the Han and the rest. 56 becomes 55 plus 1. And I would argue that it also here echoes the concept of the Hua Yi dichotomy, sometimes translated as uh, the Chinese barbarian uh, dichotomy. This is not, um, I think, too controversial. Uh, Stephen Harrell um, 
uh, and many others have shown that both state policy and popular Chinese discourses on ethnicity over the last few decades posit minorities as a less civilized uh, group than group than the Han. And I think it that requires us to ask what connections there might be between the Huayi discourse and the Han minority discourse. Um, I probably won't have time. No, I'm certain I don't have time to pursue that um, in detail. So let me let me get to the the history of the emergence of the Shaoshu term. Um, at the most practical level, it, uh, uh, it, it seems to appear first in, in 1923, which uh, James Leibold has, has already pointed out. Um, and it comes in with the, uh, the common turn, um, which brought Stalin's approach to ethnicity and nationality as he had laid it out in his Marxism and the National Question of 1913. Strangely, this book does not seem to get much attention um, by, uh, by Sinologists, despite being the underlying um, architecture of, of, uh, of minority or ethnic, ethnic policy in China today. So just uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, Stalin basically says um, there are two kinds of uh, nationalities, two kinds of, we might call them ethnic groups, Nazia. Um, one is a, is a straight up normal Nazia, which has the right to self-determination to include succe succession from any larger state. However, he noted that there are, uh, the members of some groups are scattered among other populations and lack contiguous territory. And so it's impractical for such a group to have its own state. And here he's thinking of, of uh, the Jews primarily. Um, and so their rights consist merely of protections of democratic representation and not the right of full determination. Uh, this kind of group he called, uh, he called a minority. Um, so like I said, the term was adopted uh, possibly first in 1923 at the uh, reorganization uh, Congress, but it's, I think, more instructive to look at it um, to show how it was being used in the 1931 constitution of the uh, Jiangxi, Jiangxi Soviet, um, uh, since it was the Communist Party that was going to shepherd this term into the second half of the, the 20th century. So here we can see two categories, Shao uh, Shu uh, Minzu and Ruo Xiao, Minzu, Ruo Xiao, small and weak, Shao uh, Shu, small and small in number. Um, this has, um, I think, been translated once before to to just see these two terms as like a kind of just alternating the same different terms for the same idea. But I think it's pretty clear here that these are actually two different sets of rights for two different kinds of people. The um, the Shao Shu uh, Minzu get self determination, and the Ruo Shao uh, means who get um, the right to complete separation from uh, from China, and this lines up very well with um, Stalin's um, uh, policies. Here, the uh, Shao Shu would be his his minorities, and the Ruo Shao would be would be his sort of ordinary um, ordinary. Uh, nation or nationality, rather. So we have a pretty convincing explanation for the origins of the term, but I think we also should think about the survival of the term, not just why it was taken up or when it was taken up, but why did it get kept? Because uh, probably few of you have noticed or run across this uh, Ruo Shao Minzu term, and in fact, it, it disappears. By 1945, um, when Mao writes on the uh, problem of minorities, it's it's completely gone, as is um, the uh, idea that uh, ethnic groups um, have a uh, have a right to to break off entirely um, entirely from China. So one obvious attraction here is that the the Communist Party no longer has to grant the right of secession to any of the non Han peoples uh, within the within the territory it controls. Um, and uh, this, this fits very much with the story we know of the Communist Party through the course of the 1930s and 1940s, um, pushing back against the Soviets who, who, who want this, this, this right of, of full self-determination um, enshrined in there. But I think there's another attraction that this held for, um, for uh, for the Chinese, for the Chinese state, um, and that is that minority offers to neatly divide the non-Han or the non-Hua, if you want to go to an older terminology, into those inside the nation 
and those outside. And this shift is at its root driven by a shift in understandings of sovereignty. Whereas empires, for example, the Qing Empire often claimed a kind of universal sovereignty, nations embrace limited sovereignty. Indeed, that limitation is the foundation of the concept of the nation. Um, as Benedict Anderson pointed out, the nation is an imagined political community that is imagined as both inherently limited and sovereign. So if the nation is an embrace of limited sovereignty, I would argue that the use of the minorities term is an embrace of limited barbarism. Those barbarians, and um, here I'm thinking of the yi term, which I think most people would ex today accept the barbarian translation of that, that term, although it is controversial. Um, those barbarians outside of Chinese sphere become nations of foreigners. And of course, the national the system of sovereign nations uh, 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 implies a sort of equality between nations. So they're no longer barbarians. They're foreigners. Those within become minorities. This is how a Tajik in Tashkurgan is a uh, member of the Chinese nation and a minority. And a Tajik in Tajikistan is a member of a nationality and within a Chinese discourse, a foreigner. So the label of minority then becomes a claim to sovereignty. If the Chinese um, borders determine the divide between minority and a foreigner, then it follows that by virtue of being a minority, one is naturally subject to Chinese sovereignty. This combines beautifully with the apparent numerical disinterest of the term, which says that you're a minority because you're few in number, all the while quietly asserting the dominance of the Chinese nation. Um, um, so, um, I would also say that even with the demise of the Yi or barbarian concept, and it's not completely gone, I have seen a, 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 a nice billboard talking about the army's duty to deal with the Yi uh, in the border areas in Xinjiang, but it's pretty much gone. Um, e even with the demise of the Yi, there's something kept, and that is the idea that one of the 56 Minzu is somehow special, and that is, of course, the, uh, the Han. Um, so uh, I'll move on so I don't get, uh, destroy all the question time. You have some time? OK. Um, OK, so I promised um, to talk a little bit about the effects of this Shaoshu, uh, Shaoshu discourse. And one is that the minority discourse, I think, has probably contributed to the rise of uh, ethnic tension in Tibet and Xinjiang because of its power to paper over the, 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 the widely variegated relationships between the various ethnic groups of China um, and the state. So uh, I've argued elsewhere that before 2009, uh, the widespread discontent among Uyghurs, and it is the discontent of Uyghurs with the Chinese state is extremely widespread, um, was mostly not aimed at the Han ethnicity, but rather at the, the state itself. That changed with the 2009 um, violent uh, uh, uprising and rioting in Urumqi. And ethnic animosity has remained since then. Of course, this is all anecdotal because um, we're not allowed to do any um, um, uh, sort of social science-y kind of survey work. Um, others have argued the same roughly applies in Tibet after the region's 2008 uprising. And I would say that the minorities discourse has a part to play in this. Because of the terms camouflaging of um, uh, uh, colonial domination, which I would say is not, not so significant for, for China's um, uh, claims in the international realm as it is for the effects it has on the Han settlers within China. It encourages the common Han perspective on the Uyghurs that they are A, normal citizens of the Chinese nation deserving no special consideration, and B, the recipients of unfair privileges because of affirmative action policies. Uyghur violent resistance to Chinese rule in 2009 was seen as ungrateful, as a product of Uyghur's nat natural backwardness and disorderliness. The terminology of ethnic diversity in Chinese makes it possible to see Uyghurs as dis makes it impossible rather to see Uyghurs as disaffected people under outsider rule. And indeed, virtually no Han resident of Urumqi, uh, certainly none um, that I talk with, have seen the um, have seen the 2009 uprising as a warning sign of Uyghur disaffection. Rather, the blame gets put on 
the usual for outside evil forces, uh, the manipulation of the not fully civilized, uh, the, the easy inflamed passions of a particularly ungrateful minority. Um, uh, so I think this has exacerbated animosity by making it impossible to see what weakers might be upset, upset about. Um, a second effect is found at the level of state policy, where top level policy tends to be somewhat one size fits all. Um, minority engenders a single universal philosophy of policy. There is one phenomenon that can be called the minority problem. So there can then be a single best policy to address uh, the problem. Of course, on the ground, policies toward minorities uh, very wildly. For example, among the um, uh, Hui Muslims of Qinghai, private religious schools are totally okay. Um, if, if you do this as a Uyghur in Xinjiang, um, you will be uh, convicted likely as a terrorist, um, a, a charge punishable by long prison sentences. Um, but notionally, among elite politicians and academics who drive the top level of policy toward the non-Han, the so-called minority question is a single one with a single uh, answer, and influential policy papers reflect this attitude. So uh, this then can lead to an interesting diagnosis of the problems that are occurring in Xinjiang and Tibet, which is it, it, it poses a situation in which, well, most of the 55 minorities are not resisting Chinese rule. We, got, we have 55 minorities of these, and most of them are not causing any trouble, so the, this unitary policy must be, at its root, basically correct. This is, there, are, there is debate about whether this policy is correct, um, by the way, um, but, um, but uh, the government seems to continue with the, with the same uh, policy so far. That then shifts the burdens. If the policy, overall policy is correct, that then shifts the burdens to the groups who resist. Thus, problems of government discrimination, racism, lack of representation, and cultural difference get reinterpreted as problems of religion, of reaction or counter-revolutionary politics, uh, of global terrorism, or of splitism. There are no ethnic problems in China, at least at the top policy level. There are only extremist separatists and foreign influences duping otherwise happy minorities. Um, and I think this un our, uh, the unquestioned use in academia of the minority term has, has had some somewhat similar effects. Um, we've seen lately a rise in scholarship that wants to ask the question, why do some minorities like the Tibetans and the Uyghurs resist, while others, like say the Koreans and the Dai, do, do not resist. Of course, this rests entirely on the premise that these groups are in the same category, that same category of, uh, of Shaoshu, and that they are therefore necessarily uh, comparable. That's what gives the question its sense. It this kind of question then precludes the answer that the basic historical relationship of the various groups to the state is different. For example, that the Koreans of Liaoning have long been a numerical minority governed by China-based states, while the Tibetans and Uyghurs are recent um, colonial acquisitions. Instead, it finds answers in the present. Uh, in the case of one recent book-length study published by uh, Oxford University Press, the conclusion is eerily reminiscent of uh, Chinese state analysis, and that is that minorities with overseas connections rebel, while those without them do not. Once again, we find the burden for tension shifted to the nature and activities of the dominated groups rather than the relationship of those groups to the state. So what do we do with this information? I'm actually not advocating, at least in the English language, that we get rid of the term minority. I'm rather, I'm advocating a recognition of its particular implications in the Chinese context and an understanding of how it works its magic. The challenge is that scientifically, minority is probably the right word. It's, this is the dominant term to be used for this kind of case in, um, in sociology, for example. Um, it has been questioned in Western scholarship and has been redefined to indicate any group that is disempowered, whether numerically superior or not. Um, and in fact, in academic English, it's now a, a critique of that disempowerment. 
uh, even if it continues to buttress privilege uh, in the popular level of discourse. But this hides from us the very different role of Shaoshu in China, where it continues not only to elide power and domination, but also to promote it, not just at the popular level, uh, but on all registers of discourse. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next session will be held at 3.30, so I think we have about eight minutes for any questions and, and you may have. If you have a question, please first give your name and then the person to whom you want to direct your question. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Chi Chang. I'm a local resident. Uh, my question is to Mr. Kobayashi. Uh, your document indicated that it's about 1913 and 1914. Yeah. So uh, the Chinese government at that time is not centralized. So my question to you is which group represents China in those documents? Uh, so, okay. It's on. It's on. Yeah. So you mean, uh, thank you very much for your uh, question. And uh, your question is uh, the representative from China uh, to similar conference is which which part of the which I don't know uh, which what kind of yeah uh, actually yeah so. I actually I skipped some information about the uh, Chinese uh, diplomacy about the uh, on uh, similar conference, but actually China didn't sign the treaty. Uh, I showed the documents uh, Chinese and Tibetan and not English. However, only only British and Tibetan representatives uh, signed the treaty, but China refused to sign it, and. Uh, that that representative, that representative potentially was dispatched by UN Shikai, uh, UN Shikai uh, administration. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Yes, please. Please you. identify yourself. Please. Deborah Klimberg Salter, and I have, I, I'd like to thank you all. It was really a, an interesting panel. I have two very small questions for um, Wei Rongshen and Brenton Sullivan. For Wei Rong, um, the, um, I was wondering what methodological changes you would recommend for your colleagues um, in historical studies. A Chinese and Tibetan, in order to uh, sort of bring the, the historical, the quality of historical studies in China up to, or China and Tibet, up to the international standards. And for Brendan Sullivan, it's really a small question, but I was interested on your chart about the, the historical run of these documents, you have a little tiny blue thing on the 11th century, and I'm wondering what those texts are and what the Tibetan nomenclature is for those texts. Thank you. Well. Thank you for your questions. Uh, I think the, the main issue uh, uh, about the, the Chinese so, so the, the, the scholarships on Tibetan history Maybe it's not really the methodological issues, but it's how to in, interpret the, 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 the history. I, I suggested, I think, that all, all the con uh, true history is a contemporary history. Uh, and the, the so called, the, even the, the general history of Tibet, the Tibetan, uh, the Xizang Tongsu, is not actually the, the history of Tibet, but mostly the, the history of the interactions between Tibet. Uh, and the 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 so how to say the the uh, 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 dynasties in ancient China, I think that's the main uh, problematic. I think is a is a methodology. Even they have a better methodology, or they even they, they adopted the Western methodology of doing historical studies. The the, the problem remains. I think. Thank you. So the, the blip in the 11th century, those are two texts written by a famous uh, tantric master known as Rongzong. And 
in, in general, the texts are referred to either as uh, jaik, which is literally documents that bind or documents that bind to discipline, or jatim, rules that bind, rules that bind to discipline. And um, yeah, so there are, f there are a few instances prior to the 17th, 18th century, and it, it even appears in the, the Tibetan translation of the Mula Sarvasti Vada Vinaya, but it really, it really takes off, as you saw there, in the, the, under the influence of the fifth Dalai Lama and the, the Gandhian Podang government in central Tibet. Yes, please. Uh, thank you all for your great presentations. My name is Lei Ling. I'm a G3, a G4 actually, in Indonesia here. Um, uh, I do uh, Gorkha war, by the way. Um, so my question is for Kobashi san um, I am wondering about the sort of earlier life of the term around Zen, because um, I guess you didn't really talk about that part um, too much. So can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Um, just, you know, like sort of bet before uh, the time really reached this point when um, we actually can talk about sovereignty and uh, suzerainty. I wonder, like before that, um, how this term runs in was used in sort of Tibetan history or like in a bigger context of just Tibetan literature. Um, I guess I'm asking this because I wonder um, to what extent it's... Um, because uh, there was one particular um, document you show, which I think is really interesting. It's the uh, British uh, interpretation of uh, the British uh, translation of the Tibetan text, uh, in which they turned the Ranzen term into power. Um, and I believe you argue that it's kind of different from um, sovereignty in that specific context, right? But I, I noticed that in the context, in the specific context, actually, it mentioned have power for itself or like have have power of something. Um, on its own or something. So I, I, I don't know how, to what extent you um, consider the sort of, um, I don't know, distance between the term um, sovereignty and the term for have power for itself or something. So can you elaborate on that a little bit more? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your uh, question. And the first, uh, first question I would like to, uh, when the Lanzhen, this, this ter terminology emerged, occurred historically, in the, in the history of the Tibetan language, it's like uh, actually uh, it's very uh, important question. However, uh, yeah, I don't have a uh, how to say accurate and precise uh, information about uh, this issue. And uh, as far as I know, as far as I know, so uh, so so there are a lot of. Uh, yeah, example about uh, uh, Zen or the Tempo or the Rang, something like that. Rang and Rang Wang or something like that. But Rang Zen, this kind of combination, uh, as far as I know, uh, uh, as I mentioned a while ago, uh, uh, the, the Southeast Dalai Lama uh, sends a letter to US diplomat uh, Lock here in 1910. At that time, he clearly mentioned, clearly articul articulated, articulated uh, Ranzen, used uh, Ranzen this word. I think this is, uh, as far as I know, this is a first example for me to, uh, to do, to, yeah, they, they used this, this term uh, in the administrative documents. Uh, because of the because of the lack of the documents and uh, historical materials about this issue uh, in modern Tibetan history, uh, yeah, still yeah, need to f need further information about that. And the second question, I think uh, uh, maybe I uh, just make sure that uh, contemporary Tibetan language, Lanzhen uh, means uh, independence, not sovereignty. Independence. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and then. Uh, so, actually, uh, the reason why uh, the British government uh, created that kind of uh, translation uh, to Lanzhen is that uh, I think there are uh, two kinds of uh, uh, yeah uh, reasons. Like first. Um, Cultural difference, cultural and language, the difference between 
uh, difference of the culture and difference of uh, in, uh, languages. So, uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, in my presentation, at that time, uh, there is no uniform, uh, and and uh, uh, independence doesn't have a uniformity in terms of translation. And then, uh, on the other hand, uh, maybe second, second, second uh, reason is maybe power politics. Uh, so British government, um, it's totally depend on the situation. However, British government, government sometimes, I guess, sometimes try to avoid using uh, that kind of clear political concept like suzerainty, sovereignty, uh, independence, and autonomy uh, when she had a negotiation with Tibet. It's totally depends on the situation. But uh, mm, yeah, maybe both are. We, we should think about both. We cannot, we cannot uh, too sharply uh, distinguish, distinguish between <coughs> cultural difference and power politics. So, sorry. Uh, it's, that's yeah, just my yeah, if, if I just may interject one quick, uh, quickly according to your question. The term Rangwang and maybe also Rangtsen occurs in prophetic literature that deals with the ways in which Tibetans felt when the Mongols uh, 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 conquered Tibet in the 13th and 14th centuries. If you look at the prophetic literature that took place at that time, placed in the mouse, mouth of Pambasama of the 8th century, which made it rather safe for these prophecies to occur, then uh, you'll find that, Rang, that, that when the Mongols came, the Tibetan area lost its Rangwang, that is its, if you want to say independence or sovereignty or whatever you.